I'd like to call the meeting to order and to ask members to please take their seats. Thank you. Well, welcome to the uh, organizational meeting for the House Armed Services Committee. I know we are a little light on members, unfortunately, uh, with our ever-changing schedule. Uh, there are other committees that are picking their subcommittees, um, in particular TNI and uh, Education and Labor, I believe. So we won't have as many members here as we would like, um, but they're, they're coming and going. And even if they're, they're not here, I, I will introduce them. Um, with that, I'd just like to make a couple of quick opening remarks between, before yielding uh, to the ranking member for the same purpose. Uh, first of all, welcome. Uh, returning members, returning staff, as well as new members and new staff. Um, this is a great committee, and I want to start by saying it's been a great pleasure working with Chairman Thornberry um, for, well, for as long as we've been in Congress, as long as I've been in Congress anyway, um, 22 years, but in particular on this committee. But in particular, when, when he was chairman, uh, he did a, a fantastic job of running this committee and being inclusive with everybody on both sides of the aisle, which is, which is the model that we want to follow. I appreciate that, and I look forward to us continuing to work together. And the best way to, to sum that up and sum what our committee up it, it does, you know, people have asked, you know, what are my priorities? I'm sure as members of the committee, you've been asked, what are your priorities? And there are a thousand things that we're going to work on, district-specific issues, national issues. It's one of the great things about this committee. We have an endless number of very important, very interesting, very complicated issues to work on. Uh, but at the end of the day, my priority for the committee are two things. Number one, to maintain the bipartisan tradition of this committee. We are the most bipartisan committee in Congress. Now, this joke is getting old at this point, but I then say that's a very low bar to jump over these days. I, I understand that, um, but our tradition goes back before this current situation and a whole bunch of others. We work together in a bipartisan way because we understand how important our committee is. It is our job to provide the law and the background so the men and women who put their lives on the line for our country can have the tools and support that they need to do that job. We understand how important that is, and we understand that that trumps everything else that we're doing. And during my time on the committee, what I've noticed is the way we've maintained that bipartisan uh, tradition is through leadership. Every chairman and every ranking member that we've had uh, in this position that I've been privileged to work with, you know, and there have been a wide variety of them, you can see some of them up at the walls behind us here, um, have made that a priority to work across the aisle, to make sure that the chair and the ranking member work together and that all members work together. So I hope everybody in this committee will, will understand the importance of that and maintain that tradition. And again, um, Chairman Thornberry did an outstanding job of that, was a terrific partner to work with. Um, I worked with uh, Buck McKeon before that. Um, he had a similar approach, and that, that's a huge priority for me. So staff, members, everybody, that's what we're working on. And the second thing is we produce a bill every single year. 58 straight years, I believe. Uh, only committee in Congress to do that. In fact, over the course of the last eight years, as the appropriations process has broken down around us, um, we, some years, been literally the only committee that produced a product. Um, and I want everyone to know that don't be sort of drawn in by the 58 years thing. Every single year that I've been here, there has been at least four or five times during the process when we've said, we're just not going to make it. We can't get past this. This, you know, this is you know, two. There have been a bunch of different times. I think the latest, probably, I believe, December sixteenth was the latest that we actually passed the bill. So it's not easy, but it is enormously important that we get it done. All the other issues flow into those two things. So last thing I will say is this is an outstanding committee. You know, I've worked with all the returning members. I've gotten a chance to get to know most of the new members. Um, this is an incredibly talented group of people, and I, I am privileged to be part of this effort. I think we've got a great team. I think we can do great work, and I'm absolutely confident that we will. Uh, with that, I will yield to the ranking member for any comments he has. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I'll say first, I appreciate very much the comments that you just made. Uh, and, and secondly, congratulations uh, on, on becoming chairman of, of this committee. As you, as you referenced, uh, you've been on this committee 22 years. Uh, you've been the ranking member, uh, I think, the last eight. Uh, 
you have been either the chairman or ranking member of a variety of subcommittees. In other words, as the, as the commercial used to say, you got it the old fashioned way, you earned it. And uh, I have no doubt that you will uh, be perfectly in line with the uh, portraits who are around us in, in maintaining a bipartisan tradition, but with the, 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 the priority not just to maintain it for its own sake, but, to, but, but for the reason that the men and women who are on the front lines deserve it and the national security of the United States deserves it. So, so congratulations uh, on, on being here. I look forward as well to, to our work together. I, I just want to highlight uh, some, uh, uh, some of the points you just made. Uh, I think it is a source of pride for members who have served on this committee that it is such a, I won't even say bipartisan, but I'd say nonpartisan committee. And I thought one way uh, for me to demonstrate that was just to uh, bore you with a few numbers from last year. Uh, in, when we marked up last year's National Defense Authorization Bill, there were 276 amendments adopted. 132 of those were offered by Democrats, 144 by Republicans. The bill passed out of committee by a vote of 60 to 1. We go to the floor, two, the Rules Committee made 271 amendments in order, 155 Democrats, 116 Republicans. It passed the floor 351 to 66. When we come back from conference with the Senate, it passed the House 359 to 54. It passed the Senate 87 to 10 and was signed into law on August 13th. Uh, we're not going to make August the 13th this year. We had some things working in our advantage last year with the two-year budget deal. But my point is, there, there are no statistics that you can, set, you can cite that shows uh, anything other than this is a nonpartisan committee. And the advantage is, whether you are a freshman or a senior member, whether you're a minority or majority, you can meaningfully contribute to something that will become law. And that is just not true in other committees. So it, it's, uh, and, and as you point out, the purpose is not just for its own sake, it's because we have a responsibility to do something bigger. Uh, you outlined your uh, priorities, uh, which I wholeheartedly endorse. I would just add, uh, for, from my standpoint, substantively, I want to do everything we can to make sure we don't slip backwards on the progress that we have started to make in rebuilding and repairing the military. The worst thing we can do is send somebody out there on a mission and not give them the best equipment, the best training, the best support that uh, that man or woman deserves and that we can provide. So I don't want to slip backwards. And as you know, I also want to continue to work to make the Pentagon work better. Uh, part of that's efficiency, but a lot of it is incorporating new technologies that are just essential to, to defending the country. Again, all of this has been completely nonpartisan in the past. I'm sure it will be in the future. We look forward to working with you. I yield back. Thank you, Mac. And just yeah, echoing a couple of those remarks, I also want to thank you for your work on acquisition and procurement reform. Um, the efforts to make sure that we get the most out of the money we spend at the Pentagon are enormously important, and there's still a lot of work to do on that. Um, but in addition to being the chairman, no member of this committee has done more work on that issue um, than Mr. Thornberry. So I appreciate his leadership, her continued efforts, um, and someday we will get that audit. Um, so, and I'm not just kidding, that is actually an enormously important thing to work on uh, to make sure we get there. And the second thing is, while, you know, Mac and I have had disagreements in the past about how much money to spend and where it should go and all of that, as we have throughout both sides of the aisle, the point that he made is the most important one. Whatever we decide the mission should be, uh, whatever we say, okay, this is what our armed forces need to be ready to do. It is our responsibility to make sure that they are trained and equipped so that they can do it. To me, the worst possible outcome is what Mac just described. Um, either we don't provide them the money or we decide, well, we want to do everything. So they are underprepared for what it is uh, that we are asking them to do. We need to decide what the missions are and make sure that we can fund it. Um, you know, which is you know, the pr prelude to some arguments that we've had in the past and we'll probably have in the future. Uh, but that baseline premise that we have to make sure that we provide for the missions that we're asking to be accomplished, we are 100% in agreement on. So, um, yeah, I didn't read my script. I was supposed to tell you the three things that we had to do today. That was one. Uh, 
So we're done with that. Um, now I'm gonna introduce uh, the new members and then we've got some rules stuff. Uh, so I am now going to do something um, that I don't think in the entire 22 years that I've been on the committee I have done. Um, I'm going to read, word for word, um, something that my staff gave me. Um, <laughs> I don't know if they're excited about that or a little bit nervous, um, but we have on our side of the aisle 16 new members of Congress. Now, normally I like to you know, get some memory of this stuff and be able to authentically just you know, say something about everybody. There is no way on God's green earth I'm going to be able to do that with 16 different different members. So my staff has helpfully provided me uh, with some background on everybody, um, and I'm going to introduce the members and read through that. I know some of them are, aren't here because of other committee assignments, probably, although it looks like actually most of them are here. Uh, but whether you're here or not, I'm going to introduce you. So um, get started, and then we'll turn it over to Mr. Thornberry to, to do the same. Um, so first we have Bill Keating uh, from Massachusetts, um, who is a returning member of Congress, but new to the committee. Um, he represents Massachusetts' 9th District, which includes Joint Base Cape Cod, along with several naval underwater research academic institutions around the area. He is the grandson of a Gold Star mother and a former district attorney. He joins the committee, having previously served on the Homeland Security Committee, and is a the presumptive chair of the Europe and Eurasia Subcommittee on the House Foreign Affairs Committee. Uh, welcome, Bill, good to have you. Um, our second uh, returning member, but new to the committee, uh, is Philemon Vila. He represents the 30, 34th District of Texas, which includes Naval Air Station Kingsville with the Corpus Christi Army Depot and Naval Air Station Corpus Christi in the adjacent district. Uh, Texas 34 is home to the SpaceX South Texas launch site in Brownsville. Uh, Mr. Vila was first elected to Congress in 2012. He is a former trial lawyer and the son of one of the first Hispanic federal judges. He previously served on the Homeland Security Committee and continues to serve as a senior member of the Agricultural Committee. Welcome. And now we have our, our newly elected members, beginning with Andy Kim, uh, who represents New Jersey's third district. This includes Joint Base McGuire Dix Lakehurst, the only tri service base in the country. Uh, Joint Base MDL includes units from all five armed services branches and directly employs 50,000, including 30,000 active duty. Representative Kim has worked at the U.S. State Department, the Pentagon, and has served in Afghanistan as a civilian advisor to Generals Petraeus and Allen, and has also served on the National Security Council. Welcome. Kendra Horn represents the 5th District of Oklahoma, home to the U.S. Coast Guard Institute, uh, the Mike Monroney Aeronautical Center, and thousands of civilian and military personnel of Tinker Air Force Base. A lawyer by training, she left the nonprofit world to bring her experience in the aeronautics industry to the U.S. House of Representatives. Thank you for joining us. Um, Gil Cisneros represents California's 39th District, covering parts of Los Angeles, Orange and San Bernardino counties and has numerous aerospace and defense industry companies. Rep Cisneros comes from a military family as both his grandfather served in World War II, his father served in the Vietnam War, and he earned his education through a Naval Reserve Officer Training Corps scholarship and served as a U.S. Naval officer for 10 years. Um, I will say we, we, have a, we have a good blend of our new members of people who have served in the military, State Department, CIA, and elsewhere, um, as well as people who are civilians. So I think it's an excellent mix, and we're, we're happy to have that, that breadth of experience. Next is Chrissy Houlihan, who represents Pennsylvania's sixth dist district, which is the western suburbs of Philadelphia and the Reading area in Berks County. Chrissy is third generation military. She served three years on active duty in the Air Force, followed by 13 years in the active and inactive reserves, ultimately rising to the rank of captain. She also brings to the committee training as an engineer and a background growing global businesses. Jason Crow represents Colorado's sixth congressional district, which includes Buckley Air Force Base with Fort Carson and the Air Force Academy directly south of the district. Rep Crow is a former, former Army Ranger, having served in both conventional and special operations units during three combat tours in Iraq and Afghanistan. So Shiel, and this, by the way, is a big moment I've been waiting for, is to see if I could successfully not butcher that first name. Uh, Sochil Torres Small uh, is from New Mexico's second district, which is home to Holloman Air Force Base and White Sands Missile Range, the largest military installation in the country. 
With an average of less than 10 people per square mile, New Mexico's second district faces many challenges unique to rural communities. And as I understand, it is the, the fifth largest district in the country. Uh, that's a lot of ground to cover. As I was telling her earlier, I, I can walk out my door and drive to any place in my district in about 45 minutes. Um, I, so I, I, I understand the challenge that, that you face there, and I'm very happy to have my much smaller district, but uh, I'm sure you'll do an excellent job representing it. Um, she previously worked as a water attorney and a field representative for Senator Udall. Through these roles, she worked with local governments, farmers, developers, and conservationists to protect our water. Next uh, is Alyssa Slotkin from Michigan's 8th District, which includes Ingham County, home to Michigan's capital, and Michigan State University, Livingston County, and North Oakland County, home to Michigan's Automation Alley. Just outside the district is TACOM, the U.S. Army Tank Automotive and Armaments Command. Representative Slotkin has spent her career in government service. She joined the CIA after 9-11 and served three tours in Iraq alongside the military. Rep. Slotkin has held a series of leadership positions at the Department of Defense, including as Acting Secretary of Defense for International Security Affairs. Welcome. Next, we have Mikey Sherrill, who represents New Jersey's 11th District, which includes Picatinny Arsenal, home of the Defense Department's Joint Center of Excellence for Armaments and Munitions. She graduated from the U.S. Naval Academy and spent almost 10 years on active duty in the United States Navy as a Sea King helicopter pilot, and on her last tour served as a Russian policy advisor. Next from California, we have Katie Hill. She serves the Antelope, Simi, and Santa Clarita Valleys of California's 25th District. She is the former executive Dif director of People Assisting the Homeless, which she grew from a local organization to the state's largest provider of homelessness services, where she moved thousands of families and veterans off the streets and into permanent affordable homes. Next, from Texas's 16th Congressional District, we have Veronica Escobar, and this includes Fort Bliss Army Base, which I forget, I think it's like the third or fourth largest uh, army base, uh, one of the largest army bases in the country, and she has previously served in El Paso as a county judge for two terms. Then, uh, back to New Mexico, uh, we have Deb Holland, represents New Mexico's first district, which includes Kirtland Air Force Base, Sandia National Laboratory, and a part of White Sands Missile Range. New Mexico is home to three other military installation, installations, Cannon Air Force Base, Holloman Air Force Base, as well as Los Alamos National Laboratories. Her father was a 30-year combat Marine veteran who was awarded the Silver Star Medal for saving six lives during Vietnam, and he was laid to rest at Arlington National Cemetery. Her mother is a Navy veteran who was a federal employee for 25 years in Indian education. She is an enrolled member of the Pueblo of Laguna. Now we uh, go across the country to Maine uh, to Jared Golden, uh, who represents Maine's second district, which is home to the Bangor Air National Guard Base and hundreds of Bath Iron Works employees. After the September 11th attacks, Golden enlisted in the United States Marine Corps. He served four, tour, four years in the military as an infantryman, deploying to Afghanistan in 2004 and Iraq in 2005 and 2006. Staying in the Northeast, uh, Lori Trahan from Massachusetts, his third district. Fort Devens is in Massachusetts three, and Hanscom Air Force Base abuts the district. Lori is a native of Lowell, Massachusetts. She served as chief of staff to former Rep. Marty Meehan and later founded a successful consulting firm. And believe it or not, we are now down to the last member. Um, from the great state of Virginia, Elaine Loria, who represents Virginia, Virginia's second district, which is home to eight major military installations representing all branches of the armed forces, including Naval Station Norfolk, the largest naval base in the world. A 20-year Navy veteran who achieved the rank of commander, Rep. Luria joins the committee after six deployments in the Middle East and Western Pacific, supporting both operations Enduring Freedom and Iraqi Freedom. A very large group, if we could give them all a collective round of applause and welcome them to the committee. And with that, I yield to Mr. Thornberry. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I join you in welcoming the new members on your side of the aisle. Uh, and Conaway and I are particularly glad to have some Texas reinforcements. Uh, what we lack in quantity of new members, we make up for with quality. 
Um, we have two new members. Uh, first, in his second term, uh, Congressman Jack Bergman from the 1st District of Michigan. He served in a Marine uniform for four decades, starting as a combat assault pilot in Vietnam and finishing as commanding general of the largest force level organization in the Marine Corps, responsible for roughly 100,000 Marines and sailors. Lieutenant General Bergman is the highest ranking combat veteran ever elected to Congress, but he says you still don't have to salute him. Um, and secondly, a uh, new member of Congress, Representative Michael Waltz from the 6th District of Florida. Uh, he is the first ever Green Beret elected to Congress, served our country on the battlefield, including multiple combat tours, and uh, also served as a senior national security policy advisor in the Pentagon and at the White House under Vice President Cheney. He is still serving as Lieutenant Colonel in the National Guard, and we are very glad to have both of these new members join our ranks. Welcome. And we are, we are being, being joined by Mr. Brown, who's, we're in the majority now, we're on this side. <laughs> yeah, actually, when we got in the majority after 10 years in the majority, I didn't realize that they flipped the sides that you sit on just based on that. So, um, welcome, Mr. Brown, the, the vice chairman of the committee, Anthony Brown. Um, all right, now we have some business to take care of, so... We'll get through the script here. I call up committee resolution number one regarding the committee rules for the 116th Congress. The clerk shall read the resolution. Committee resolution number one, resolved that the Committee on Armed Services U.S. House of Representatives adopt the committee rules for the 116th Congress, which are stated in the copy distributed to each member. The promote, I'm sorry, the proposed committee rules have been developed jointly by Ranking Member Thornberry and made available to members' offices on Monday, January 21st. Following consultation with Mr. Thornberry, I ask unanimous consent that the resolution be considered as read and that the resolution be open to amendment at any point. Is there objection? Without objection, it is so ordered. At, the at this time, is there any discussion or are there any questions concerning the committee rules? If there is no further discussion, are there any amendments to the committee rules? We'll take that as a no as well. Ready. There are no amendments. The chair now recognizes the gentleman from Rhode Island, Mr. Langevin, for the purpose of offering a motion regarding committee resolution number one, the committee rules. Mr. Chairman, I move to adopt committee resolution number one concerning the committee rules. The question now occurs on the motion of the gentleman from Rhode Island, Mr. Langevin. So many are as in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed? A quorum being president, the ayes have it, and the motion is adopted. And without objection, a motion to consider is laid upon the table. The next order of business is committee resolution number two, unsurprisingly, I suppose, um, regarding the committee's security procedures for the 116th Congress. I call up committee resolution number two. The clerk shall read the resolution. Committee resolution number two, resolved that the Committee on Armed Services, U.S. House of Representatives, adopt the committee security procedures for the 116th Congress, a copy of which has been distributed to each member. The security procedures were coordinated again with Mr. Thornberry and were made available to members' offices on Monday, January 21st. Following consultation with Mr. Thornberry, I ask unanimous consent that the resolution be considered as read and the resolution be open to amendment at any point. Is there any objection? Without objection, it is so ordered. At this time, if there are, is there any discussion or are there any questions concerning the security procedures? Okay. If there is no further discussion, are there any amendments to the security procedures? There are no amendments. The chair now recognizes the gentleman from Rhode Island, Mr. Langevin, for the purpose of offering a motion regarding committee resolution number two, the security procedures for the 116th Congress. Mr. Chairman, I move to adopt Committee Resolution Number Two 
the Security Procedures, the 116th Congress. The question now occurs on the motion of the gentleman from Rhode Island, Mr. Langevin. So many as are in favor will say aye. Aye. Those opposed? Quorum being present, the ayes have it, and the motion is adopted. And without objection, a motion to reconsider is laid upon the table. And I am, oh, I thought we were done. There's actually a committee resolution number three. Um, on to the final order of business. I call up committee resolution number three, appointing committee staff for the 116th Congress. That's actually kind of important. Uh, the clerk shall read the resolution. Committee resolution number three, resolved that the persons listed on the sheet distributed to the members and such other personnel as may be required by the committee within the limits and terms authorized under the rules of the House of Representatives are hereby appointed to the staff of the Committee on Armed Services, U.S. House of Representatives for the 116th Congress. It being understood that according to the provisions of law, the chairman will fix the basic salary per annum. As many of you know, our committee is unique in that the committee staff is a combined staff. The committee staff is here to provide advice and counsel to all of you, Democratic and Republican members alike. Please feel free to avail yourself of their services. They are a talented group of professionals. And, and this point actually bears emphasis. Um, the single greatest asset that we have on this committee are these people you see lined up around us. Um, we have an unbelievably talented staff uh, that are incredibly important to the work we do. Uh, please take advantage of that. Um, whatever the issue is you're working on, um, these people can help you. They do an outstanding job for us. Um, in fact, I'm going to ask you to give our staff a round of applause. Um, They, they work incredibly long hours and do an outstanding job. So appreciate having them. Look forward to working with them as always. A copy of the committee staff of the 116th Congress was prepared in consultation with the minority and made available to members' offices earlier this week. Following consultation with Mr. Thornberry, I ask unanimous consent that the resolution be considered as read. Is there objection? Without objection, it is so ordered. At this time, is there any discussion or are there any questions concerning the committee staff? Yes, Mr. Thornberry. Mr. Chairman, I was, I was going to make a point that you made, but I do want to emphasize it. This is another way this committee is different from all other committees. Now, you see some of these uh, ladies and gentlemen on this side and some on this side, but we have a unified staff, uh, which means any member can go to any member of the staff, and, it, and they will help with whatever issue you want to talk to them about uh, and and that just does and they have different expertise and so I also encourage uh, all members to take advantage of that unique aspect of this committee which also helps us maintain the strong uh, bipartisan tradition here thank you I yield back any further discussion if there is no further discussion, the, now reckon, uh, the chair now recognizes the gentleman from an island, Mr. Langevin, for the purpose of offering a motion regarding committee resolution number three, appointing the committee staff to the 116th Congress. Mr. Chairman, I move to adopt committee resolution number three regarding committee staffing for the 116th Congress. The question now occurs on the motion of the gentleman from Rhode Island, Mr. Langevin. So many as are in favor will say aye. Aye. Those opposed, no. A quorum being present, the ayes have it, and the motion is adopted. And without objection, a motion to consider to reconsider is laid upon the table. Without objection, committee staff is authorized to make technical and conforming changes to reflect the action of the committee in adopting committee resolutions number one, two, and three. Uh, before we adjourn, there is apparently a brief administrative matter. Uh, oh, yeah. Okay. Um, we have a five-minute rule in this committee. Um, basically, when we have hearings, when we do markups, you all have, have five minutes to speak. We are going to try to strictly adhere to that. Uh, the, on the only exception to that is, well, me um, and the ranking member. Um, who we, we are by tradition not on the clock. Um, and you know, it's a big committee, so a lot of members to get to. Uh, I always like to emphasize that just because you have five minutes, you don't actually have to take all five minutes. Um, now, I understand, you got important things to do, and if you do, and it's, it's quirky, if you need to, that's fine. Um, but it's not required. And, and the other thing is, um, I sort of have adult attention deficit disorder to a certain degree. Um, not during hearings, but in markups. We're going to try to move things along um, as quickly as possible. But also, I want a robust debate. 
Um, so I find it better, if you got something to say, say it. If you can say it more briefly, that helps more people be able to say their piece. So I'm gonna try to move that along as quickly as possible. Um, but I understand, as members of this committee, you have districts to serve, um, you have issues you're, you're pressing, we have the witnesses, we're gonna try to get to all of you. Um, I'll warn some of you down further um, that we consistently have witnesses, particularly when they're from the Pentagon, who have hard stops. Um, and you know, we don't always get to everybody. Um, you, you will figure that out a, a, as you go, but we will try. Um, uh, we, we will do our level best. Um, I believe, I don't know if this is formally in the rules or if we do this, and the way it works that I was unaware of at first is you are in line when the gavel falls. It's by seniority uh, for the most part, but if you're not here when the committee starts, you lose your place in line. Whoever is here, they're in line. And then as you come in, you then go to the end of the line. Um, and I will say something that every member of this committee learns after about the first day, you can show up for the gavel falling, leave, and then monitor it and come back when you ask your question. I don't necessarily recommend that, depending on what you, what you have, uh, but I wanna make sure that everyone's aware that, that that's the rule. So if you're sitting there waiting to be called on and we call on somebody past you and go, what? That's why. Um, I think that's everything. Mac, you anything else on that? Okay, all right. Um, I just did that informally because my next line says, let me recognize Mr. Thornberry in case he has any closing comments or wishes to add to this discussion. Good. All right, cool. If there is no further business, the committee stands adjourned, subject to the call of chair, and I look forward to working with all of you.